more welcome to everybody to our first anniversary at Science Cafe. Like Ruth already mentioned, my name is Martin Ihoyame. I'm one of the co-founders of Science Cafe. So it is with pleasure that I welcome everyone to our first anniversary. Science Cafe is an evolving community that offers nascent and early career biosciences, an interactive platform for personal growth, career advancement, collaboration, self-discovery, and expression. Through our weekly sessions in this community that incorporates article review, open discussions, presentations, workshops, and research-based webinars, we help young bioscientists to preserve and nurture their passion to pursue their chosen careers in science. We've also been intentional about honing our members' skills in teamwork, science writing, and communications. Other areas include content creation, especially with the introduction of our volunteering program six months ago. We've welcomed both local and international guests across an array of bioscience research areas in the world. In the 100 plus sessions over the past year, part of our goals for this event is to address key factors upon which the future of Africa's bioscience research lies. Our guests will share insights on the roles of science communication and policies, as well as young people like you and me in shaping this future for Africa. We also have workshops to tackle selected challenges faced by budding scientists in Nigeria and across Africa. Our workshops cover science writing and alternative routes to sci science research skills acquisition. Our networking and open discussion sessions will provide a forum for participants to connect with one another and share their views on the challenges and prospects of um, pursuing bioscience research careers in Africa with our participants from Ghana, South Africa, and other African countries. We look forward to a rich and diverse discussion during this event. So we sincerely hope that attendees do not only benefit enormously from our lineup of events and guests, but that they, also, they are also provoked to, in one way or the other, in their little way, commit to shaping the future of Africa's bioscience research. So once more, welcome again to this event, and I hope you all have a nice time. Thank you. Over to you, Ruth. Hello, Ruth. Can you hear me? All right, Ruth, I'm done. Over to you. All right, thank you so much, Red. Yeah, um, I want to welcome everyone once again. And yes, we'll be going to uh, scientific discussions now. I want to let you know that we have a couple of them this Friday that you would undoubtedly enjoy. And there would also be time for questions and answers. So be sure to... Um, paint down your questions and share your thoughts in the chat box. I'll be dropping a couple of rules and regulations in the chat box this year, so be sure to check it. And so we're going to our next item in the event today, and that is presentation. Yeah, I want to let you know that prior to these events, we actually had a call for early career researchers to showcase their research work. And today we have Dola Ola Woyin with us. He is a 2021-2022 Chevening Scholar, currently studying a master's in food, food science and nutrition at the University of Leeds, United Kingdom. He graduated from the Laduke Akitola University of Technology, Nigeria, with a B.Tech degree in um, medical biochemistry. He emerged as the best graduating student. He has had diverse experiences cutting across the pharmaceutical industry, clinical laboratory, and academia. In 2020, Dolako worked as a teaching assistant at the Labisi Banjo University in one of Nigeria's biggest pharmaceutical industries in Nigeria. 
He has published three academic papers in international journals. He's passionate about helping young people develop their research skills. He confounded Science Cav actually, and you, as you all know, Science Cav is a committee focused on inspiring early career bioscientists passionate about science research and, and career advancement. Um, so I would like to welcome Dolapo Olawoyin with us. He will be sharing his research work on smart proteins, a new horizon in the development of novel nutraceuticals for disease treatment. You are welcome, Dolapo. All right. Um, thank you so much for the for the warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. So a quick one just to confirm if um, you can hear me clearly. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. I'm sure right. everyone. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So um, I'm really excited to be here, you know, um, I year one year anniversary and most importantly, to be on the other side of the of the table today. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. So just let me know if you can um, see my screen, uh, okay? All right. Can you see my screen? Hi, Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so today uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, um, the topic, smart proteins. Um, sorry, uh, well, I'm distracted by people who want to enter. Can you please uh, help me admit them? I, I could see it all pop up on my screen. No worries, I'm on that. Uh, all right, thank you. So again, to confirm, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. So I'm speaking on the topic, um, smart proteins, a new horizon in the development of uh, novel nutraceuticals for disease treatment. Um, so just a quick one, I want to make a poll, just a nice breakup. So you are gonna see a poll now, you can answer the question. So the question is, do you know about bioactive peptides? So everyone can just um, answer the, the poll. All right, uh, we've got quite a number of people responding to the poll, okay? All right, um, I'm just gonna hand the poll now. Some people are still now, okay. All right, perfect. Um, so about about sixty percent um actually knows about um, I mean they know about bioactive peptide, whereas uh, 50, 40 percent do not know about bioactive peptide. Uh, that's a good one. At least that's going to help my presentation. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask this one again very quickly, please. I want you to like respond to you. So this will help our presentation. What protein source do you prefer? All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think uh, quite a number of people went for um, animal protein. 
Yeah, all right. Thank you so much for participating in the poll. All right. Um, so basically, I'm going to just introduce you to our lab. Um, as you all know, I'm currently studying a master's in um, food science and nutrition. And currently, I'm working with uh, Dr. Allen. And in our, in our lab, we basically look at um, uh, smart proteins. So we look at, I mean, protein from uh, certain food product, you know, from animal or protein sources, but not just the protein. We want to like isolate, isolate this protein, characterize them and see uh, uh, their, their bioactivity. Most importantly, how they can, um, you know, be used as functional food or nutraceuticals, uh, you know, as, as health promoting agent particularly to target uh, molecular diseases such as uh, diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. So we, we identify food uh, resource of protein or the, the could serve as functional food. We isolate this protein. And then once we isolate them, we now kind of check their bioactivity. But not just protein this time around, I'm talking about um, smart protein. And that is what my presentation is going to center around um, today. So um, to the next slide. So why are we concerned in our lab with, with smart proteins? Why do we want to study these, um, you know, these molecules? Now you will see that chronic disease continue to impact human health. Uh, according to World Health Organization, uh, you know, diseases such as cancer, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disorder are the leading causes of death uh, globally. Uh, if you can see my notation, you can see that every year, the lives of 15 million people are cut short, you know, due to this non-communicable disease. That's, that's, that's actually so huge. And um, if you look at this part, if you can see my notation, 71% of all deaths worldwide are linked to um, non-communicable disease. And the basic non-communicable disease are cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic respiratory diseases, cancer, diabetes, and mental health condition. So more disheartening is that every two seconds, someone aged 30 to 70 years die prematurely from non-communicable disease. So we can see that this is a, this is a huge problem. Now, in spite of the uh, variety of existing drugs, the prevalence of lifestyle diseases are growing exponentially. And predictions suggest that it's going to rise to 333 million by 2025. Now, of course, few drugs have been proved to be quite effective in some of these conditions, you know, but the safety issues associated with this compound are believed to be due to their unnatural molecular structure. So this actually poses a problem uh, to the clinical field, especially uh, the management and treatment of this disease. So therefore there is a need for natural alternative such as nutritional solutions to prevent and treat this condition. And that is what uh, we are interested in in our lab. So we want to see how um, we can use nutritional strategies to treat uh, disease. A quick one, just a quick check. Are you still following? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, we are with you. All right. Oh, uh, yes. OK, OK, thank you. Sean, can hear you? OK, thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Um, okay, now, um, can, can we still see my slide? Yes. All right, thank you. So uh, I have a chart here, I, I, you know, and on this chart, I'm trying to uh, tell us that food is now beyond basic nutrition. Now, let, let us look at this chart. Uh, sorry, you might see a lot of annotation that could have been to the, due to the network. I was trying to go to my next slide. Uh, don't worry about that. So uh, you will see that at some point, uh, you know, in time, at a point in time, 
The reason why we eat food basically is just because of uh, basic nutrition, right? Now, this is a kind of, a, you know, an evolution of food and consumer behavior over time. So in the past, food used to be something that, oh, let's just take it for uh, basic nutrition. And at some point, uh, people began to see that, sorry, people began to see that uh, food can actually um, offer health benefits, right? Then most recently, or let me say a few years back, uh, there is an advent of functional food and nutraceutical food, which um, scientists are now looking into for protection or risk reduction and um, for prevention of diseases. But um, food is now going beyond just prevention of disease as we have seen in functional food and nutraceuticals. We are now at the era where um, researchers are using uh, nutritional solutions as medical nutrition therapy. And that is uh, the stage we are today. So to treat uh, as therapeutic target, to treat uh, diseases. Um, so um, if you can see my slide, you're going to see this uh, um, chart here. Oh, sorry, I don't know why this annotation is showing. Can you see annotation on my slide? I'm just, okay, good. I'm just gonna clear it now. All right, perfect, I've seen it now. All right, so um, these are the major, sorry. These are the major biomolecules. You know, we have the carbohydrates, we have the, the proteins, we have the lipids, and we have the nucleic acid. Now, bi biological molecules, these biological molecules are now used as functional ingredients and, and nutraceuticals. And of course, uh, you see that, see that the current health scenarios describe uh, growing public health problems such as diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. Therefore, researchers are now focusing on exploring bioactive compounds from different food sources. Uh, we've added about you know, um, uh, dietary fibers from carbohydrates, you know, probiotics uh, to improve digestibility. Uh, you know, when you talk about lipids, you look into you know, omega-3 fatty acid, uh, uh, essential fatty acid and their role in health promotion. You know, when you talk about proteins, uh, minerals, so all of these biomolecules are now being used as functional food, um, you know, ingredients, functional food ingredients um, to, to treat or ameliorate disease uh, condition. And this is a very nice picture of uh, a food fortified with uh, nutraceuticals. This is a product that is rich in, um, you know, dietary fibers and, and uh, probiotics and vitamins and minerals. But that's not where we are going today. Uh, basically, it's just to provide a, a, a background to, to where uh, I'm going. Now, um, remember the topic is, is uh, smart proteins as novel nutraceuticals, right? Now, I'm going to be starting with uh, this background topic, proteins. I I'm not going to spend too much of time here because we all know, um, you know, this concept. But of course, um, I, I like to point a few things. Proteins are, are polymers of amino acid. You know, when different amino acids come together, then we have proteins, right? And then, um, um, so who can, who can tell us uh, what binds these amino acids together? I want you to be as... Uh, interactive as possible, just anyone. I mean, what brings this protein together? So we want to volunteer. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, my proteins are brought together by peptide bonds. All right, um, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. They are actually connected with peptide bonds. And yeah. that's where we are going. So I'm going somewhere, right? Now, proteins are, are brought together by uh, what we call peptide bonds. 
So we could have as much as, you know, 20, 50, even thousands of amino acids coming together. And then we say we have a protein, right? Now, proteins are actually, you know, they are well known for their structural, um, uh, I mean, uh, their chief structural components of uh, major uh, structures of the body, you know, the hair, the nails, and the skin. And of course, they are part of the biological enzymes. And most importantly, they are, uh, they are very crucial for growth, for development, maintenance, repair, and proper functioning of the body. But there is one thing that, uh, you know, we are not aware about. So we know that, okay, when I take in, um, I mean, protein, I'm gonna be, you know, have muscle mass, it will help me grow effectively, or we know that a growing child needs high amount of protein. But there is something that protein, proteinous food offer, and that is uh, the serve as bioactive peptide sources. And that is what I thought smart proteins. So despite protein money, uh, many functions, I, I wrote here, larger protein structure are less bioavailable. Now, the problem with large protein molecules is that they have less bioavailability, they have less bioactivity, and they have higher allergenicity. allergenicity. Yeah, they are very allerg allergenic, and they have low functional, nutritional, and organoleptic properties. Hence, bioactive peptides, which are relatively low in molecular weight, with high bioavailability and functional properties, are now of great interest to researchers and the food industry. Now, this is the peptide bond I was talking about. You could see this is one amino acid and this is another one. And when they are joined together with the uh, release of water, then we have uh, a dipeptide, right? Uh, I'm just going to move very fast now. I want to establish the foundation now. So what are bioactive peptides? Now, do not be confused. When I'm talking about bioactive peptides, I am still talking about the smart proteins. Don't forget, the smart proteins are different from just the proteinal structure you know. So these are bioactive peptides that offer a clinical uh, you know, effect or therapeutic effect, and they are produced from protein. Now, we are going to be getting an overview of what bioactive peptide are, uh, is all about. So bioactive peptides are also known as cryptide, and they are short oligopeptides usually containing two to 20 amino acids. So note that they usually they contain two to 20 amino acids. Now, bioactive peptides are usually enclosed. They are encrypted in their parent protein, but they are not released onto the hydrolysis. And this hydro hydrolysis can occur either during um, digestion, in, in vivo, that is inside the body now, gastrointestinal digestion, or enzymatic hydrolysis, which is done during food processes by enzymes such as peptidases. Now, bioactive peptide can be gotten from, you know, proteinous rich foods such as meat, egg, uh, oyster, microalgae, and plant sauce such as cereals, fruit, and pulses. So they offer a wide range of benefits, including anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, antimicrobial, anti-hypertensive, and hypolipidemic uh, effects. Now, one advantage of bioactive peptide derived from food is that they do not accumulate and they are less toxic compared to a conventional drug. Thus, they are now a great, of great interest in um, healthcare products. Now, um, the bioactivity of, of peptide, don't forget we have established that bioactive peptides are released from parent protein by the activity of certain uh, peptidases or uh, or, or, or proteases. Proteases are enzymes that cleaves protein and then they release them into their constituent amino acid. Now, the major mechanism by, through which bioactive peptide work is basically due to their physiochemical properties of the amino acid chain. So it could be the charge, it could be the polarity. For instance, um, uh, studies have shown that, I mean, peptides, I mean, bioactive peptide that, uh, you know, uh, positively charged, that contains positively charged amino acid, could have um, antimicrobial uh, properties. And how would they do that? They can interact with uh, the phospholipid membrane of bacteria, you know, penetrate into it, and then destroy the cell wall. So that is one mechanism. So it is very important to understand the biochemical structure 
of the amino acid constituent of the bioactive peptide. Don't forget, peptides again are amino acid, you know, coming together, held by what we call uh, 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 the peptide bonds. So bioactive peptide could be about two to 20 amino acids. Sometimes it could be three, sometimes it could be four. But what really dictates their function is the R group, which dictates the physiochemical properties, and then the chain of the amino acids. So sometimes when the uh, peptide is too long, they may not have offer, uh, they may not have exert any biological activity when compared to the lower, uh, 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 you know, with the one with lesser amino acid. So also studies have also shown that, you know, um, amino acid that have large molecular weight may not be able to interact effectively or, uh, or solubilize with cell, you know, in vivo. So look at the, let, let us look at the, uh, the process of bioactive peptide production. Now, this is a dietary protein, right? Uh, once the protein extraction and purification has been done, then we can see through the fatting, you know, through several process centrifugation, isoelectric precipitation, then we have the protein concentrate. And once we have the protein concentrate, this is usually very rich in protein, about 80% to 90%. And then at this point, we can now hydrolyze. This is not our bioactive peptide. This is the protein concentrate. You can see the uh, molecular structure, the, um, uh, um, uh, what do I want to call it? Infographic that I created here is showing a long chain of, um, of amino acid, but immediately it is cleaved. You can see through hydrolysis, we have what we call protein hydrolysis, which contains amino acid and the bioactive peptide. So this is the protein hydrolysis, which now exerts um, certain biological activities, such as you know, anti cancer, anti diabetic. So that is the picture. The bioactive peptide are cleaved from, I mean, they are isolated from, the protein are first isolated from a proteinous rich food. And then they are then hydrolyzed with certain proteases. They are commercially available enzymes. You know, we have alkalase, then also we have uh, pepsin, we have, uh, you know, a lot of proteases that can cleave this protein and then, di I mean, digest and create our protein hydro hydrolysis. It is this protein hydrolysis that now um, exerts certain biological activity. Now, this is the process of um, getting a protein isolate, just like I explained. And this is a very beautiful um, infographics here uh, to show you how you can uh, um, purify, characterize, and, and um, isolate. And this is basically what we also use in our lab. So, you know, you can see the after the protein is isolate, I mean, um, uh, isolate has been gotten, we can then perform pr protein hydrolysis. Then we can isolate, purify through membrane filtration or chromatography. Then characterization of the peptides through databases, LCMS, um, bioinformatics. Then we can then generate our bioactive peptide. We now study in vivo or in vitro. We can conduct an in vivo or in vitro um, clinical studies to understand what specific role does our bioactive peptides uh, have or what health benefit do they offer. Uh, so these are the 20 amino acid structure. I'm not going to delve into that. Uh, so this is where um, I am going. So this is one of the research uh, conducted by our lab. So uh, the title is the, the uh, title of the, of the research is Anti-Cancer Activity of Protein Fraction from Chia. So Chia is called uh, Sabia. The botanical name is Sabia Hispanica. And you can see uh, the image at the right corner of my screen. So why did we conduct this research? Sorry, a quick one just to check. Um, if you are still following me, I, I can't. Yes, we are following you. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just gonna rush uh, through it now. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. Okay, so we just got a few minutes more. Yeah, sure. I'm good All right. Around. Yeah, thank you. So um, why did we conduct this research? So cancer is a, is a leading cause of death globally. And uh, this research was actually conducted to study the anti-cancer activity of chia seed. Chia seed is mostly consumed in Mexico and, and Central America. And they use it as toppings for smoothies, 
breakfast series, series energy bars, and, and yogurt. So because there are a lot of, I mean, about four frequent cancers such as breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer are very common in Mexico. So the aim, uh, the, the objectives of this study was to evaluate the anti-cancer potential of chia protein fraction on four cancer cells, the breast cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and liver cancer. And um, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study uh, that was conducted to identify. So the novel function of uh, protein hydrolysis extracted or isolated from chia protein and the anti-cancer activity. So um, this was the methodology. So from the protein source, just like the process, I mean, the procedure I mentioned the other time, uh, the chia seed was grinded, they were degummed, crushed and defatted. They were then centrifuged to obtain the protein isolate. Uh, the protein isolate were then hydrolyzed using enzymatic hydrolysis. The pep pepsin pancreatine enzyme hydrolysis system was used. And then of course we obtained the protein hydrolysis and they were then, um, uh, I mean, they were, con I mean, they were fractured using ultra filtration. And then we, we got this protein fraction. So the, the protein fraction we got was um, less than one kilo Dalton, the three to, uh, sorry, this should be three to five kilo Dalton. And then we have got the one to three kilo Dalton after conducting the ultra filtration. Um, sorry, I'm going to move very fast now. So um, after that, the protein fraction effect was, you know, was conducted to check, I mean, the cellular viability of cancer cell line was, uh, you know, uh, was determined using the protein fractions. So basically we used, um, um, you know, the, the MTT assay. So the MTT assay is, is tetrazonium assay. And what it does is to understand is, is a kind of a colorimetric uh, assay that checks if the cell, uh, how much of the cells are still alive when uh, they were exposed to this anti-cancer agent. Don't forget, we have already extracted our protein fraction that contain the bioactive uh, peptide. And this was done actually on different concentration of the uh, protein hydrosyl hydrolysis. And of course, um, you know, uh, these were the main findings. So I'm just gonna explain the main findings. And um, you can see that when the protein hydrolysis was exposed to the cancer uh, 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 lines, or I mean the, okay, sorry, this is the HFB, this is the human fibroblast, and this is the normal cell. Of course, uh, it was also exposed to the normal cell to, to understand if the anti-cancer protein peptide is actually uh, toxic. And as we can see here that the cell uh, viability uh, was actually about, 85, which is more than 80%. And according to Lupex, uh, Cassia et al, 2014, he said that if cell cultures, well, when the cell viability is 80%, the level of cytos cytotoxicity is negligible. So this indicates, or this may suggest that um, the exposure of, our, of our, all the cell line, uh, including, I mean, the, uh, the fibroblast cell, Hello, sorry, my network got disconnected. Can you still hear me? Oh yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Can hear you. Right, I got disconnected. So um, as you can see, uh, there were no, um, sorry. Um, sorry. So um, there were no le level of toxicity to the human fibroblast uh, cell. So that may suggest that our anti-cancer peptide um, is actually safe for the human uh, cell. So of course, um, on the, now this is the, the cancer cell line. So we have the MCF cell, which is the breast cancer. We have the CACO2 cell. We have the PC3, which is for the, which uh, is testing for, uh, 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 you know, the prostate cancer cell. And we also have the FG2 uh, cell. So in the, breast cancer, we can see that uh, the, the one kilo Dalton protein actually significantly, um, you know, reduced cell viability. And of course, uh, whereas the, um, 
3.5 kilodalton uh, add less, you know, reduced viability on the cancer cell line. So this indicate that, you know, the 1.3 kilo, I mean, the less than one kilodalton um, uh, protein fraction uh, reduce the cell uh, growth when compared to the 3.5 uh, kilodalton. And of course, um, Zio et al has reported a similar study that when peptide, this peptide was isolated, obtained from Caesar Aritaneum, uh, you know, the cell line resulted in positive inhibitory uh, effect. So in essence, uh, the less than one kilodalton in all the cell line actually reduced uh, cell viability. And this may suggest that because of the low molecular weight of the protein, don't forget I explained that the lower the size or the structure of the, of the peptide, the better the availability and the interaction, molecular interaction. So if you look at all of the cell line, um, the less than one kilodalton fraction protein significantly inhibited uh, cell growth or cell proliferation, which may suggest that it has, um, it's a potent anti-cancer agent and may be you know, formulated into functional food. So the analysis of the peptide was done. I'm not going to talk about this. And this was the peptide we, we got. Uh, we found the KLKKNL. And of course, that met the criteria which we use to dictate whether it has anti-cancer uh, activity. And this is the proposed mechanism of the anti-cancer actions. So it's basically based on necrosis, right? Sorry, I'm just going to finish up now. Uh, it's a very extensive research, but I'm going to complex it. Uh, so the reason why we actually, I mean, selected the criteria was that uh, the amino acid had high hydrophobicity, you know, it, it had a net charge of plus three, and it also contained positively charged amino acid. And um, several studies, you know, studies are, some studies have shown that amino acid that have, uh, I mean, peptide that have positively charged amino acid, uh, you know, can interact electrostatically with the cell, cancer cell, you know, with the phospholip phospholipids, which are negatively charged on the cancer cell line. And then once they interact with it, they can cause cell death. They can break the cell and cause uh, uh, necrosis. This is one of the many uh, mechanisms of action. So in conclusion, bioactive peptide from dietary protein may offer health benefits ranging from anti-cancer, anti-apertensi, antimicrobial. The present study showed that the bioactive peptide obtained from chia seed had anti-cancer properties along the cancer cell line. Despite the elucidation of several mechanisms of action of peptides, uh, the exact mechanism of action by which peptides destroy cancer cell death are yet to be described. It is likely due to cell cycle arrest, activation of tumor suppression, suppressor proteins, or inhibition of cell cycle kinases. Uh, future research can actually study the exact mechanism through which the bioactive peptide isolated from chia protein exerts its anti cancer effect. Uh, BAP from chia seed can be formulated into nutraceuticals or functional food to treat cancer. Uh, thank you very much for listening. That will be all. So I'll take questions now. It's an insightful presentation about smart proteins. I'm telling you, this is the first time I'm hearing smart proteins. So thank you so much. I believe that we have lots of questions for you. Um, it's just that I would just encourage everyone that have questions to kindly just drop them in the chat box. We'll just be able to like would get them answered um, later on, actually. So please let's celebrate Dolapo. That is a nice presentation. Thank you so oh, thank much. You. So if you have any questions, please you can raise your hand. And you can drop your questions in the chat box. So for now, we're going to be moving on to the next item in our program of event, and that is a symposium. Our guest speaker is already with us, and I would like to invite my co-host Emmanuel to please come up and um, read the citation of our guest speaker. You're welcome, Emmanuel. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome once again to the anniversary celebration today. And 
Um, welcome to our guest speaker too. Okay, so um, our guest speaker for this session is Dr. Isawomi Abiola. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens. He investigates the antimicrobial resistance mechanisms of common and novel superbugs. His research is providing insight into how understanding bacteria resistance pathways can inform treatment strategies against infections. Dr. Isawomi studied microbiology at Obafemi Awolowo University in Nigeria, where he also acquired his master's degree in genetics and molecular biology before proceeding to earn his doctorate at Waxbib. Um, he has published some of his works in, journally, in journals as well as magazines and is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Hello Bio Lab Heroes Award in 2020, first one up, and the reputable Gordon Research Fellowship to present at the antibiotic conference and seminars held in the summer of 2018 in the United States. He has also been an academic visitor at Harvard University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Aside from research, Dr. Isaomi is, passion, is passionate about coaching young people about success and leadership. He also does parallel publishing, copywriting, amongst several other pursuits. We are honored to have you in our midst, Dr. Isaomi. Please, you can um, um, go ahead with your presentation, sir. All right, thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah, let me just share my screen. All right, um, let me start by saying thank you for this platform, and especially for the opportunity to interact with you guys this evening. I also want to congratulate you on your first year anniversary. Personally, I think it's highly gratifying and fulfilling to see young Nigerians taking up initiatives such as the Science Cafe, especially to advance the cause of humanity and also to engage people to live a good life. I think I'm very much proud of you. I'm going to encourage you to do more. Um, there's more ground to cover. Um, don't be too much excited. Let's celebrate because your best is yet to come. My talk this evening would be around how we can shape bioscience research in Africa. And I'm going to start with a more personal story. In 2018, 2019, I was two of the Africans sponsored and selected to participate in the Gordon Research Conference in the US. This is a conference where you have the opportunity to interact with people you have read about in textbooks and journals, people doing interesting and awesome researches, especially in the areas of antimicrobial resistance. After my presentation, the feedback was overwhelming, at the same time, very encouraging. But what was most shocking was a few people thought I did more than what was expected from a usual African researcher. And I met Kelvin Yale, who happens to be um, a young professor at MIT. In his own words, he said, I have never met a brilliant African like you. I wasn't offended. I rather see it as a challenge, an opportunity to do more, and also to advise young Africans to represent Africa very well on a global platform. Kelvin felt that he's impressed by the kind of effort I'm leading against antimicrobial resistance from high-risk environments such as the hospitals in, in Africa. So he felt that I should come to MIT 
So Calvin invited me to her mind, mind, change who we become or who you become. What you find is important, no doubt about that. But who you become is more important. For no one will remember you for what you find, but who you become as a result of what you find. So my questions this evening as I'm starting my talk to all of you is what are you finding? And who are you becoming? You are a master student, you are doing PhD, you are a lecturer in the Nigerian University. You are doing something. I think daily you should ask yourself, what am I finding? And how is what I'm finding changing who I'm becoming? So what you find is called discovery. What you become is your reality. Your reality is the reality of your family. Especially if you are the golden child or the bread The reality of your family becomes the reality of your community. And putting all of these together, it becomes our national relationship accentuated with what I call relevance. The strength of your reality against your discovery is relevant. No matter the kind of research you are doing, the kind of discovery you are making, it is not relevant. It's not going to help people. It's not going to become a policy. There is no way policymakers are going to leverage on what you are finding if it's not relevant. And if it's not helping people too, then it's useless. But you need to also understand that no matter how relevant my discoveries here and my research is, it has to be well communicated to the people because they have to understand it. And if the policy maker do not, and I will ask from here is, what is bioscience communication? I think bioscience communication is turning scientific findings into a story. All scientific audience do not understand core science. Most of the times, they are not interested in the experiments we perform in the lab. So what they look out for is what it can do for them or to them. The moment it can help them, then they don't see the, the need for it. But how do you get this across to them without using the scientific jargons and bringing the tables and the drafts is to turn it into a story. Story beautifies the dignity of humanity. In story, we understand the world better. And the best way to get across to these people is to give them something they can easily relate to, and that is story. Even policymakers, the moment they see the story, they take it up and they make use of, make use of it to advance the cause of humanity. But one thing you need to know again is that to turn your scientific findings to story is just one thing. You have to learn to own the story. I've been privileged to meet interesting African doing interesting researches within Africa, outside Africa. They have beautiful ideas. But when you ask them, please, you need to convince me about this idea. They don't even know what to say. They have an idea. They have scientific findings. They've done beautiful experiments, but they don't know how to, how it, to take ownership of that story. So how do you start taking ownership of the story? The first thing you need to do is you have to believe it passionately because you have to believe before you become. You have to affirm it unapologetically, irrespective of where you are doing the research, irrespective of 
the part of Nigeria you are doing the research or the part of Africa, you don't have to be apologetic about your story. It is your narrative and you have to learn to own it. You have to say it as it is openly. And I need to warn you here, your story won't be perfect, but you just have to be honest. You just have to be honest. And you need to again know that the story is not about you. So what you are trying to do is you are taking ownership of the story for who the story belongs to. Research belongs to people. People are always at the center of our research. People make research relevant. Okay, and policy makers, as the case may be, they need the relevance of the research because it's not about the researcher, it's about people. It's about the world. It's about people you deal with. So the story is for them. And you must learn to tell the story in the right way. How should you tell the story? It has to be simple. If it's not simple, we will not understand it. Policymakers, um, people that need the research that we are doing the research for, they, they don't understand science. If, if it, science is too big, they will not understand it. It's not going to help them. Then your language has to be clear. Your style has to be clear. Then it has to be specific. You can't solve all the problems. You need a target and you have to carve a niche for yourself. And you need a working strategy. Then it has to be realistic. It has to be meaningful. It must make sense. If it doesn't make sense, no one is going to accept it. Then again, it has to be genuine. One thing I think I need to say here is you can't cook up data, you can't forge data as researchers. Because if a researcher forge this data, what happens is that they start killing people. And again, your thoughtful expression must be accurate. Assumption is a sin for researchers. You don't assume, you don't think for people. So you have to let them see that you know what you are about and what you're talking about. So from this point, I want to engage us on how we can shape research in Africa using the tool of communications and policy. And I think the best way to do this is to make scientific knowledge common. When COVID came, we all realized that science is for the people. It's for all of us, it's about all of us, it's about the world. But people will not understand this science until we make the knowledge common, until we present the knowledge, we package it in such a way that it will be acceptable. So the way we can make people irrespective of location, the color of their skin, their status or whatsoever, to begin to enjoy the fruit of science, or scientific finding is to make the knowledge common so that I don't have to go to school to understand science. I don't have to be in the lab to begin to make use of scientific finding. So the knowledge has to come out. It has to be obvious. It has to be something that people can relate to. And I think if you go by this principle, we would be able to shape research in such a way that it's going to advance every other thing that we do as a continent. How do we make scientific knowledge come on? <clears throat> so the first thing I want to address is what I call decolonizing science. All over the world, in different parts of the world, people are advocating for decolonization of science. You need to know that knowledge is not your property. No one owns knowledge bought knowledge, borrowed knowledge is no one's right, is no one's property. So we have to come to that point that we engage the community that we are doing the research for, that they also have a part to play in science, that irrespective of their level of education, they can use science for their own benefits because the knowledge is not for the researcher. It is not for 
those people that are colonizing sites, it is for the war. So gone are those days when you open a um, scientific textbook and you are going to see a white aged man with beard, a lot of beard, with pair of glasses in the lab and he's trying to add something to something that you don't even understand. Those days are gone. Now science is for everybody. No one owns that knowledge because no idea is independent. Irrespective of what your idea is going to be, or what your idea is, your, your idea is, or is going to be in terms of bringing it to point of execution, you are not the owner of your idea. The moment you are trying to colonize the idea you are developing, then it's going to die with you. So we need to understand that success is not a westernized right. It doesn't be belong to some set of people. And how do we do this? They have to start using the tools of communication to let people know the education to preach this, then we'll be doing better research in Africa. Equality is tolerance. Reality is experiential and not necessarily observatory. But I need to know and let people know that the only way to do better research is to participate. So most times, participation. So we need to advance the cost of research in Africa. What equity says is, I want to be the best. But if you feel that being the best is going to be a threat to you, then let me be me. But if you are not comfortable with me being me, then let me be. And when we leverage science on this platform, then we will see science better. And when we see science better, then we'll be able to project the necessary tools and machineries that we need to advance the course of research. Then again, I want to talk to us about intersectionality. Now, difference is not a disadvantage. Black, white, mango, orange, difference is not the basis for comparison. Okay, so the difference should be the point of our strength. Your difference, my difference, where you are coming from, where I'm coming from, shouldn't be an excuse. It shouldn't be a limitation. Even if you are not educated, it doesn't limit the fact that you have a role to play and you also have access to scientific findings and you can make use of it to propagate science for yourself and also to do necessary service that can help you and people in your sphere of influence. As practice is not discriminatory. For instance, if a patient is being admitted, is on his sick bed, is gasping for breath, is dying, and a medical personnel walk into the room, you are not going to ask him, that please, are you a Cameroonian? Or are you a Nigerian? Or are you from Kenya? You are not going to ask that question. You're only interested in the expertise. Can the work be done? Yes. Okay. And that is exactly the way we can advance science. The moment we start giving credence to expertise and we start valuing people based on merits that have what it takes to do it, then we will do better research in Africa. Again, I want us to understand that because you know how to use something doesn't make you an expert. Use is different from expertise. Okay, now, there are big professors in our Nigerian universities and some other parts of Africa. They have been teaching the same course for 30 years. 
they are using the same notes to teach every year. And when you ask the question, then you feel like you're challenging the authority. And they tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years. And so what? It doesn't make you an expert. So use doesn't make you an expert. And I want to really advise us to be careful of experts. Sometimes experts, they make things look difficult until you do it. They present it to you in such a way that this cannot be done, but it can be done, but they just make it look like it can be done. Then we need to understand what I call debulking dynamics. It means that you are going to have a vision. You have a vision for your, for your life. You have a vision as regards your career. You, you have a path you are trending and you are, you are trading. You have what you are looking out to. Be rigid on your vision, but be flexible on your approach. The moment you learn to diversify, you start giving opportunity to other ideas to come into play, to help you fulfill your purpose in terms of your research career or research dreams, then we get things done well. And one of the best ways to do this is to repurpose old knowledge for new achievements. There is no waste garbage anywhere in the world. Most researches that are done in beautiful labs in the world are done using old knowledge. They repackage old knowledge for new achievements. And one of the best ways to define success is to do differently what people do commonly or to do in a better way what people have done before. Again, we should promote organic knowledge. For instance, if you are looking for an expert on Africa and we have gone to Oxford or Cambridge or MIT to go and look for a professor to come and talk about Africa, he hasn't been to Africa before. He doesn't know the challenges we have in Africa. He only knows Africa from afar. He knows Africa on the map. He even thought that Africa is just a country and is telling you that I'm an expert on Africa. It's not going to work. So sometimes we have to look inside before outside. Success is first within before it comes out. So we should start giving opportunity to what we have around us before we start thinking about what we can gain from people. We need to promote indigenous organic knowledge. We need also to find a way to accentuate locality relevance. If you are taking up any research as the case may be, you need to understand the relevance of that particular research to you and to your locality. So if you are doing a research, say um, in Port Harcourt, for instance, and your aim is to ensure that you are people in US or people in UK. What about people from your locality? So most times people don't respect your research or scientific finding until it takes a kind of preeminence within your locality. I also need to push to us something I call the inclusion and diversity. I think if we really want to shape bioscience research in Africa, we need to start giving up some level of control. We need to train young researchers. Okay, now you don't need experience before you get employed because the experience you need to do the job, most time you get it on the job. So if they are, they are recruiting for PhD positions, if they are recruiting for master's position and all of that, most of the times, you get better when you start doing the work than even before starting the work. CV can be very deceptive. So I think our big researchers in Africa, quote and unquote, should start giving opportunity to younger researchers. You need people to make mistakes while doing the research. You give them opportunity to fail while they learn. And that this is the way we can give opportunity for others to also be part of the research. Opportunities are for all of us. And you have to define what your opportunities are. So I can't sit uh, within the limit of a border and say that, oh, okay, I don't have an 
access to opportunities because I'm in Nigeria. No, excuse is a gentle way of telling that. Okay, I can't make excuses because there are opportunities all over the place. But the point is the preference. The point is your option. The point is the choice you are trying to, you are trying to make. So you need to draw a line between what is yours and what is not yours. Not all open doors are your doors. And the moment we understand that, then we start shaping bioscience research in Africa. Let's promote right opinions. I have friends that have come, that have gone to UK, US to do PhD and they are back in Nigeria in their former university to teach. And probably when they're having seminars or any meeting or whatsoever, they start to come up with um, interesting ideas. The old people, old professors say, shut up. We knew, we knew you when you were doing your master's here. Or we, we spoon fed you. We knew you when you were in your nappies. So you can't come here and you, have start, you start bringing foreign ideas. I think it's good if we give opportunity to write opinions to lead. Okay, and the best way to shape science research in Africa is exactly that. Let's allow this to, um, to take advantage of different compromising situations we have in our, um, in our academic system. Then again, what I call the language ecosystem. Now, and this is very important because people will not understand the language until you get it, understand science, the research, until you get it to them in the language they understand the best. For instance, I'm a Yoruba guy, I'm from Osun State, for instance. I don't think in English language. I think in Yoruba language. I think in Yoruba language. Okay, if you go to China, they learn chemistry or they are learning chemistry in Chinese. Okay, if you go to Japan, they are learning biology in Japanese. If you go to France, they are using French to learn English. Don't you think you will understand chemistry better if they have taught you using Igbo language or Aousa language or Yoruba language? So what does it mean? It means that if I understand research when it's properly communicated to me, then I can tell people, I can tell my grandma what my research findings are, and she will understand it if I can speak the language. English is overrated. English language is overrated. It is needed, but it is overrated. I think we should start reducing what English language represents in terms of pushing ideas here and there. Because we, people we are doing the research for, most of the time, don't understand the English language. We have to get it to them in the language they understand the best. And I want to talk about objectivity. As researchers, one of the best way we can use our communication to, to achieve, one of the best thing rather, is to start telling the truth truthfully. You have to tell the truth. So if your research is not working, don't forge data. Don't try to do combination and permutation. You are trying to ensure that everything works the way it should work. You add an expected outcome. But the point is that if we know what we were doing, don't be called research. It is your data that is the data you are trying to generate from the research you are doing in the lab that will lead you. So it's the research that will lead you. It's not you leading the research. So but people start telling lies here and there. And in such a way, we, it affects the quality of the kind of research that we do in Africa. And most times, when people put different lies together and they put it in form of a publication, then they send it to predatory journal. And that is, this is something I need to talk about. I've sat on interview panels before. I've reviewed masters for um, I've reviewed applications for master's degree program. I've reviewed for PhD. And you review application of someone that is coming in to do PhD, and he has 35 publications. And you engage him in one or two of those publications, and he doesn't know what you're talking about. It doesn't know the jack you are talking about. And you ask, you publish this paper. I would say, yes, but you don't even know the simple technique that you use. Okay, and that's a big challenge that we have in Africa. 
So you, you want to ensure that you get your work published and you just send it to a journal that is not, that is not known. It's not valued. People don't see the reason. It's not obvious. Or they will say we need it for promotion. And after promotion, what happened? And that is why I said earlier that research is when what you find change who you become. So it won't change what you are becoming like that. And the moment what you are becoming is not changed, it affects your reality. And that, in a way, is going to tell on our society. So again, there is an issue of African citation gap. I'll give you an example. Some people in 2021, this present year, they are trying to publish a paper. They are trying to, sorry, conduct a study in Brazil. But that study, a similar study was conducted about 10 years ago in one part of Africa. But since they are conducting the study in 2021, they won't cite that article published 10 years ago because it's coming from Africa. Because why? One, where the article was published is not known. The moment they put it in PubMed, you can't see it. It's not known. That's, that's one. Secondly, they don't believe it. And that becomes a problem. So instead of citing the work that was originally done 10 years ago, we should support the work they are trying to do now. They rather go and look for all that study, similar study conducted in US or UK. And this is killing research in Africa. And most of the time, you can't blame those people because of the predating mindset that most African researchers have. They just want to get promoted. They don't need any other thing. So what about, in a way, instituting what we call continuous relevance? So let me begin to come to um, the end of my talk. I would want at this point to challenge you a little bit. I don't know what you are doing presently. I don't know the part of country you are in. I don't know what your dreams are, but I'm telling you today, because I'm a living evidence and testimony that your dreams are possible. Your dreams are possible. I don't know what your dreams are. They are possible. Because the dreams of today are the realities of tomorrow. So I'll show you something. You look at this. If you look at this very well, you discover that you know most of the people here. Maybe I, maybe I should think so that you know most of the people that you have here. I know you might know this woman here. This is Pearl. You might know this woman. And I guess you might know this woman too. This is myself here and a few other Africans. What's my point? The point is that we are all from where are you, we are some of us here now. We came from funny backgrounds, rugged background, things that you can't start talking to people about. But the point I'm emphasizing this evening is that your dreams are possible. And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you that you should dream it, but don't stop at the level of dreaming it. You have to do it because some dream it, some do it, but some people, they do both. The people you see here, it is a representation of, oh, this was in October. They were celebrating um, black scientists in the UK and they pick this set of people that they are representing science. They are doing the kind of science you want to do. Why? We dreamt about it or we had the dream years ago. Then we took steps, we did it. So you can do it. There is nothing impossible for you to become. So if I'm to, if I'm to advise you, what I'm going to say, if I'm to advise you this evening, what I'm going to say is no one owes you anything in life. No one, no one owes you anything. The government of Nigeria or the country you are in, they do not owe you anything. Your parents owe you education. They put you through school. Sometimes people send emails 
um, please, can you mentor me? Can you coach me? And they talk as if you owe them something. You don't owe anybody anything. And the moment you start realizing that, you start taking responsibility for yourself instead, instead of pushing responsibilities to others. Research is a lifestyle. It's beyond dying in the lab. Oh, we are doing experiments. Oh, we are gathering data. Oh, we want to change the world. Research is about fulfillment. And you need to know that people also do research to become rich. People get rich doing research. I've seen people buying houses, buying cars. I've seen people, tr they travel all over the world Why? with research. So you are not doing research because you feel there is no job. That's why you have come to do master's or you are doing PhD. No, you are doing it because there is a fulfillment in it. Then again, let me tell us about the kind of dream that people fulfill. My father wanted a family medical doctor. And because of that, he made me write UTME, jump of those days, four times. So which means I was at home for four years. I was at home for four years. What was I doing? I was writing them to go to university to go and do medicine. There are times that your parents want you to fulfill dreams that they fail to fulfill. They most time do not give you opportunity to see what you can do with your life. Irrespective of whatsoever you are doing, ensure that it is your dream. You are not fulfilling someone's S dream. We are not all going to do medicine. Medicine or medicine is overrated. Okay, research is beautiful. Medicine is no more prestigious than research or whatsoever. We need to understand that. And again, I need you to, to know that there is always a fault with default. You, the moment you realize that you have beautiful research ideas. Parallel universe. It's something I'm preaching to you this evening. What does it mean? I can't give excuse that because I'm in Nigeria, I can't do the best that I'm orchestrated in such a way or ordained to do. The world is parallel. So you can sit anywhere in the world and you start launching to different people from different parts of the world. Location is not an excuse. And status is not an excuse. But you just need to know how to do it. And the last thing I want to say here is that talents are good, but talents won't take you far. You need to educate your grace. And what does that mean? It means you should build competence. You should build competence. And I tell people everywhere I go, and I have opportunity to talk, that when you find your grace in selling grass, you will always, or you will soon have a grass to grace story. What you need to do is to locate your grace. There is a grace attached to research. There is a kind of grace attached to career. The moment you maximize that grace, you will soon have what I call grass to grace story. And finally, Science Cafe, you are doing so well. I'm proud of you. I'm in support of your vision and what you are doing. By 2030, you'll be celebrating your 10th anniversary. I know by that time, you would have been bigger than this because your best is not behind you, it's in front of you. Because when you decide to win, you are always the winner. Thank you this evening for having me. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Isaomi. We really appreciate every word you've said. These were highly impactful words. And I'm sure in the coming years, Every of these we practiced in our various areas of research. And it would be evident that hearing you speak today was um, part of the tools to our, our, our advancement in, this, in our scientific pursuit. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure uh, there are lots of questions, there are lots of um, comments. Um, please, I would take just one or two comments um, for Dr. Isaomi. If you have one, please raise your hands. Um, please, I would like to, and don't, like was stated, please don't unmute your mic until you've been 
I am called out. Does anyone have any question towards what has just been said? So far, the, um, the, the chat box is filled with appreciation. And I'm sure as, as much as I've been overwhelmed by everything, I've been overwhelmed by many of the things that we've said so far, I'm sure every other person has also gotten very impactful things. If anything, one of the biggest points I've, been got, I've gotten from this is make your research, com communicate your research to the people you are making your research for. Let your research be able, let your research be effective enough to reach those they are making the research for. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. So um, before now, there were questions that were, that were asked from the previous session. And okay. we would like to go into that now for the presentation that was made by Dolako, a member of our team. There's some presentations that, were, that came Okay, Alimat, please, you have, please go ahead with your question. Okay, hi everyone. Please confirm that you can hear me. That's yes, please, okay. go on. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Isao. This was very, very beautiful. So my question is, you, when you were talking about the communication part, you emphasized more on research. Is science communication limited to only the research aspects or does it include um, ideas that have not yet gone into research, just they're in the, let me say, incubation stage? So does that story and trying to relate it to people cover the ideation process or is it until the research begins that we start to make a story out of it? Uh, can I take that? Yeah, can I take it? Yes, please, go ahead. Sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, like, like I said, it's, it's not only about when the research, you've done the research. No, it's not about that. It's about the moment you start thinking about something to do. What we define as research is not actually working in the lab. It comes from the point that you, there is a need and you want to fill that need. And you have to start recruiting necessary machinery. People that you think might be of help in that area. When you have a vision, you need people that will join hands with you to ensure that that vision will come to pass. People that might be, that will believe in it. So getting to talk to them, getting them to know what it's about, getting them to know the roles they have to play and all of that. So it's not a function of, and um, you just have to get to the point of research before you start talking about, you know, it's from the point of you thinking about doing something. And it's not even only about research. You, could want, you, might, you, might, you, you, you might want to come up with um, initiatives such as, such as Science Cafe that we have here. You might want to come up with, um, maybe you want to start, want to start an NGO, You've noted something, or not, so you noticed something in your community, and you feel that I think I have something to play, some role to play in that area, as the case may be. So the moment you start thinking about that, then you start talking to people. And now you can get up. I, let me tell you one thing that I've really, really enjoyed and realized in my career is that the moment you notice someone can be of help to you, ask for help. They can only say two things no or yes. And when you are going to talk to them about whatever you are doing, don't be too positive. At the same time, I'm not saying you should be pessimistic. Don't be too positive in the sense that when you get there and they tell you no, you won't go and commit suicide. But the moment you get there and you say that, they say no. You always get someone that will say yes. And no doesn't mean it can be done. It means next opportunity. Okay, so it's not, it's not a problem. So it's not when you get there. You can pick it up. Any, even if it's an idea of writing a book, 
or you want to go into a, into a studio, you want to record a song, or you want to do anything, the moment you have that, it will start thinking about who can be of help to you, who can you talk to that can come to your aid. So th that, I think that will be my response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Olayton, I noticed your hand was raised during the session. Do you still have your question? Before we go to the question in the chat box. Yes, thank you so much, um, Emmanuel. Yeah, I still have my question. Yes, um, I think my question is somewhat similar to that of Alima because why, why, thank you so much, Dr. Isawumi, for this wonderful presentation. You know, I was, I was, I, the part of, um, communicating research that is making research um, relatable. That is, um, he really caught my attention because, um, you know, we have, um, that is, is, is a major issue. Like, how do we get this research out to um, the layman? In fact, things like um, drug resistance and antibiotic resistance. How do we tell the market to man? That doesn't even know anything. That at the slightest instance of um, stomach cake or anything, is popping um, 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 drugs already, you know. How do we tell people who are we to target? And you know, that making relatable stories, that is um, communicating our research using relatable stories. So that's where my question is that, how do we, um, is it possible to bring such um, research like this, um, um, like where the other speaker talked about um, B B BPAs, that is bioactive peptides. How do we tell a layman how do we, is it possible to relate um, this um, world class researches that we're having in the world? And the world, the world of research, the research we have now is very beautiful. But how do we relate? Is it possible to relate the entirety of this kind of research to, um, to the layman and to, um, audience that are, to an audience that are not really vast in our field of research? I think that is where my question is. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. Now, what I think I'm going to start with is when you, when you come up with any scientific finding and you're turning into a story, there is an aspect of story that is specific for some group of people. So you have to tell the story that they need to listen to, the story that is going to help them. And one of the, there are so many ways to do this, but one of the best ways to do this is you can write on trending stories that is not scientific. So the question you ask yourself, we have done that and I've done that with um, my message around antimicrobial resistance and all of that. Talk to people, public engagement, organizing seminars for even people that do not know anything about antibiotics and drug and all of that. So you ask yourself, what is trending now? That's one key question you have. What is trending now? So that it's going on now. So you use that, you just ride on that to preach your message. For instance, COVID is, is all over the place. Even now, when you write some two sentences and there's COVID, the people want to listen to it. And personally for me, I've used COVID to preach also the message of antimicrobial resistance. Because the study that I did before COVID came, personally, when I was drafting policy statements for Ghana Health Service here, and some other part of um, the work and um, where I worked, one of the key things that I was able to let people know is that a time will come when we will not be able to undo researches. What does that mean? It means that we are doing the research. We want to get it across to people, okay? But we don't have what it takes to really undo the strength of our scientific findings. And the best way to do it is to look at things that people are, can easily relate to. Things that people, that every day they have to um, go around. So these are some of the ways to ensure you get your message across to people. Beside this, you need to know that there's something that they call layman summary. That's time when you are publishing papers or even you are submitting your PhD thesis, they will say layman summary. So it means that all the peptide and all of whatsoever you have put together and you have generated and you have done in the lab, now you have to put it 
in such a way that is going to understand, people are going to understand. I'll give you an example. When I was defending my PhD thesis, the external examiner asked me a question. You have done beautiful research. He said, but how will you explain this to your grandma? How will you tell your grandma? And I explain the way I'm going to tell my grandma. Because one, I need to understand the people I'm going to tell the story. The moment I understand them, I know what they need. Getting the story across to them is not going to be a problem. So I just need to use necessary tools that I have around me. So little packages, little ideas, a little here, a little there, bringing everything together to push it across to them. But one best way it works with is to look at stories that are on now, and it, it has gone viral and all of that. And you use that principle, you write on it, and you get your message across to the world. So there are quite a number of ways to go about this. But Maybe some other time we have opportunity, I can um, elaborate this more. Thank you very much, sir. Um, yeah. I'll be reading some questions from the chat box now. We have just two questions. And after that, we'll move to the next session. Yeah. So the first question says, the first question said, um, thank you, sir. You mentioned that no one owes anybody anything. Yeah. How do we relate this training and mentoring upcoming researchers or scientists. Okay, so how, I we, how, do we, how do we relate this to training and mentoring upcoming researchers or scientists? Okay, yeah. Now, I made that statement in context, and I want to explain it. Now, when people, I, I'm going to use myself as an example. People send you emails, please. Um, can you help me get admission to go to university of this? Please, um, can you help me to do this? If people write to you and say, please, um, I'm sick, I need money. Oh, um, I, I'm six months pregnant. Please, can you be of help? And um, maybe you are trying to ask, oh, okay, uh, sorry, you are pregnant. How are things going? Okay, what about your husband? And the person gets angry. Okay, or oh, oh, you are trying to ask, oh, if you have to get a school abroad, where you have to come and study, you have to do your homework very well. Which school do you want to go? Which call to sell? Because you are, also because you're already there, you should be able to help us. Most of the times, people feel that you owe them something and they push responsibility to you, okay? And what you need to learn to do is to take ownership of your life, to take responsibility for your life. And people don't get that. They feel that um, you are, people are there to be of help to them. Yes, they are there to be of help to them, but you must know how to assess that help. So that's why I made the point that the moment you start thinking that, oh, they owe me something, they owe me something, they owe me something, you will be limited and you won't do what you really have to do. There are people that have tried in this world that achieve outstanding success without even people and without, without getting necessary help they need. Okay, but what they knew is that it is my life and I have to take responsibility for it. And in relating that to mentorship, mentorship is a voluntary thing. And if an old researcher is going to train someone, they, I like average people that are willing. Willingness is another thing. So you want to be trained, you want to be mentored. I don't owe you that mentorship but it is part of my responsibility to train you because I won't be here I won't be here forever. I will live one day and you have to step up and take the responsibility, but you still have to open up for me to be of help to you. There are times people write you a message, email and say, please, I want you to coach me. And you say, please, can you give me a paragraph of what you want? When they write it, you look at it that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So that's why I made that point. I take ownership of my life. I know I have the grace of God that can push me through. I'm going to take responsibility with God. I'm going to assess necessary help that are available unto me, but I'm not going to allow someone to dictate the tune of my life by thinking that they owe me something. No one has the permission to be better than you until you give them the right. And people give excuses so much that, oh, I can't do this because I don't have money. Or I can't do this because I don't have people to help me. I can't do it. They are just excuses. People are going through a lot. And they put what they go through, they put it aside. 
because your going through is just a go through. It's not where you are going. So you need to understand that, and that helps you more. So mentorship, owing, I don't owe you the mentorship, but it is my responsibility to train you. And the process of training you, I make it open to you. But I cannot force you. It is a choice. So when you make choices, there are consequences. But when you decide to live your life to ensure that I need this, I need this. When I train interns in my lab or student or whatsoever, I know students that cannot go far. Because you can tell from their work ethics, you can tell from the way they respond to things. Now what I try to do is to guide them, but you can't force them. There are times that some people you have to sit on their neck to ensure that it's done. Why you are trying to impact their life, not because of yourself, but because of the coming generation. So most of the times we need to find a way to balance this. No one owes me anything. I need mentorship. What is the balance? I take responsibility for, for my life. So I get it here, I get it there, and I push forward. So I don't sit in there and feel like, oh, it should come to me. No, I take it. I take the initiative. I write the, I send the email. I submit the application. I push forward because it's not going to come and start knocking my door and say, oh, please, I'm looking for you. Oh, come and get this done. So that's why I made, I made that point. And I think I'm clear now. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Okay, now one last question. Okay. Um, the question says, what are the factors to consider in making your research relevant to your locality, especially with the pressure of going for studies in foreign nations? Yeah, I think it's a, that's, a, that's a very beautiful question. Okay, that's, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a very beautiful question. There are quite a number of things you have to start looking into. I think, I think it starts from you. It starts from you. To make it relevant. I'll give you an example. So when I was starting my PhD degree, I wanted to do antimicrobial resistance. I didn't have specific reason, but I just wanted to do something like that. I feel that might help people. I'm looking at it in the context of relevance. Okay. So um, when I met my supervisor for the first time, and I said, I want to go into hospital environments, and I want to sample different formats. I want to look into the air and get the bacteria that I have there and I want to study them. They said, it didn't make any sense. That you don't do that, that's not PhD. I said, well, that's what I wanted. They said, that's not PhD. Okay. Then <clears throat> the people sponsoring the project told me that it didn't make sense. But I saw the locality relevance. That's why I said you should be careful of experts. Sometimes, they tell you that, oh, we have been doing this, it's not going to work. So they make things look difficult, but it's not that difficult, but you just have to step into it. You need their experience to guide you. You need their wisdom to, to really live well, but actually there are times you need to step up. So I said I wanted to do it, that I just, I wanted to do it. So another reason was because there was no one with the expertise in that area. Then I need to now start looking for people that have the expertise to get it done. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to say is you have to believe it yourself. If your research cannot be relevant to your locality without you believing it. That's why I said you have to believe it passionately. People most time they don't believe it. They are only interested in, please, I want my name to be part of the paper. Please put me on that paper. Please, I have to be there. What have you done? Nothing. Because I need it for promotion. I want to put it in my CV. So you have to believe the work first. It is about, it is you. So my research is me. And when I talk about my research, you see my passion. You think that is the only research that people are doing in the world. So I have to believe it first. That's the first way to let the relevance be obvious to people in my locality. And the second thing you have to do is that the moment you let them see that you are passionate about it, then you let them see what they can gain from it. So what can you gain from what I'm being? So when I meet people, and they say they have ideas, there's something called elevation pitch. And I ask, can you tell me one thing this thing will do to me? What will it do for me? Was it, oh, eh, it's going to, it's not going to do anything for me. Most time, the end product might not be discovery of a drug or antibiotic. You might probably provide insight into how it can be easily done in, in the years to come. Okay, so I need to know what I'm going to gain from me. One of the things you need to do is that, for instance, if you are coming up with a product in your community 
and you have to present it to people, the first question you are going to ask yourself is that, will you buy it? Will you buy it? Okay, so if I don't know what I'm going to gain from it, I'm not going to, be, there's no way you can communicate the research. How am I going to, how am I going to tell people about it? So I need to believe it. Then secondly, I need, I need people to see what it's about and what they can gain from it. So that's why when you go for interviews, they say, what are you bringing to the table? What are you adding to this organization? So that's the second thing. What can people get from it? Then the third thing is that if they are going to get this thing, the relevant comes to how much am I going to get it out of there? Do I have to pay to get it done? The moment money is attached most of the time, people don't see the relevance. They switch off. Okay, because they, should, they think that you should understand that, oh, we don't have too much money around. So which means that I believe my vision, you can get something from it, but you don't have to do so much to get it. That's another factor you have to look at. Okay, and the fourth thing which I also mentioned is that the moment let them see that you don't have to, you don't even have to pay to get it. I have the knowledge, I can make it available to you. But another thing is that, is it easy for me to assess? Can they easily assess it? That's why I said it has to be simple. The simplicity is very important. Most times, we, I like, I, I don't like big science. I don't like big science. It is big. People come with graphs and all of this. You don't even understand what they are saying. When you ask them, what did you get from now? I said, nothing. The guy, the guy talked. The guy can present. But I didn't get anything from it. So the question is, can it be easily assessed? And that is what I need them to see. So all of that, putting all of that together, yes, going abroad to study is something that is good, that is very important. But most of the times, you need to know that a lizard in Nigeria can never be a crocodile in US or UK or wherever you are going to study. You still need that necessary competence like I mentioned to you, that you have to educate your grace in pushing this forward. So all of these factors put into place, respecting your locality, bringing the value down home, pushing it out, seeing the way you can make this happen. Science here, science day, advancing science at home, abroad, wherever you find yourself, the beauty is, in the, is not in the color. It is in the value you're adding to people. And you are going beyond just generating research data into adding value to people to help them take advantage of their advantages. What is that advantage? The product is from my locality. What is it? I believe in it. When you believe in what happened, I make it available to them. Do they have access to it? Yes. What do they have to do? They don't have to do too much. They just need to respond. And that make it work. Yeah. Wow. Well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabomi. It was great to have you in our midst. And um, we, the echoes of the message just heard is still vibrating in our mind. And every part was very wonderful. And we appreciate your effort. And we also, as you've promised, and as you said, Science Cafe will definitely grow. And we also believe that in the time we are celebrating our 10th anniversary, we'll also hear of your great accomplishments in your research and your in your in further areas too of your career. Thank you very much for being in our midst. And um, we're moving on to the next session right now. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, hello everyone. So we're going to the next session. I'm sure so far with every part of this of this um, of this meeting tonight has been very, very wonderful. I, I, I doubt if anyone has gone through so through it so far and has not gotten something yet. Um, let's get set for our open discussion. But before we move on to the open discussion, um, I noticed there were some questions that were dropped during the Lapos um, presentation. Please, I will just take two of it and then we'll move on. I think over time, I, would, I might I will call out the questions and maybe um, you could chat the, the chat them up later on and you would further explain some of these concepts. But we, don't, uh, we are running out of time and we'll just attend to just a few of those questions. Okay, so um, uh, please, before I go on, is the lab available to answer these questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. This one is confirmed. Um, so the first question said, 
how is the hydrolysis of protein guided to cleave out specific peptides required? Um, how is the hydrolysis of protein guide, guided to cleave out specific peptide required? And then the next question said, peptides are known for the activities of being inactivated by endogenous proteases. In your research, was there a comparison with chemotherapeutic agent, chemo, chemo, chemotherapeutic agents in terms of their duration of action? And okay. then the last question, can I let me just read out the last the question? Yeah, or, that's uh, fine, yeah, yeah that's fine. Yes. And the last question said, um, we are the bioactive peptides specifically characterized from the plants or the whole protein fractions were screened for anti-cancer activities? Okay, so very quickly, I'm just gonna um, answer the question. First, uh, <laughs> let me apologize again. It's a really very complex, uh, uh, you know, wide research. So, I mean, I couldn't contain it. So there was some information that I could not see. Maybe uh, subsequently, I may want to like uh, give presentation on that. So um, for, for the first questions, if, uh, uh, the pe how do we know the peptide? I mean, how do we know the enzyme to be used to, I mean, specifically catalyze um, the peptide? Um, well, you know, at the stage of the protein hydrosylate, we are not, at that point, we don't, it's not like we, we find, uh, I mean, we look for commercially available uh, enzymes to cleave out a particular bioactive peptide that would um, exert a particular biological activity. So at that stage, we still don't know what we are doing, the reason why we are realizing is just to, I mean, I mean, um, uh, kind of, you know, isolate our protein or bioactive peptide with protein with other amino acids. So at that point, it is still protein hydrosylate containing bioactive peptide. And basically, what we do to, I mean, why we, I mean, the choice of our enzyme will now depend, you know, is based on previous research. So you want to understand that, okay, these are uh, enzyme can release short amino acid. That is one of the things we look at that, okay, it could, it could uh, release out uh, short amino acid, which is very, very important for anti-cancer property. The amino acid must have a uh, short chain. So moving to the second um, uh, question, did we compare uh, the anti-cancer peptide with uh, a chem chemotherapeutic uh, uh, agent, synthetic drug, right? If I get that correctly. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, it was compared with Taxol. So Taxol is um, uh, a chemo, chemo um, therapeutic agent. Uh, we also studied the effect of uh, the cell line uh, um, viability inhibition with Taxol. Yeah, so it was compared. Uh, uh, you might want to like check the slide later for more information on this. It was on the uh, ma major find, the main findings from the research. Uh, the data was, was there. Uh, for the last uh, question, uh, where the protein, where the peptides specifically characterized from the plant, the whole plant, or uh, protein fraction. So here's the thing. After we, we obtained our protein hydrosyl, hydrolysate, uh, which also contained other amino acid and bioactive peptide, uh, we did an in vivo study to assess the anti-cancer property. So it wasn't the whole protein. So it was, I mean, the whole uh, protein from the plant. We obtain protein fraction. Don't forget, we had the um, uh, the uh, less than one kilo Dalton. We have the three one to three kilo Dalton, and then we have the three to five kilo Dalton, which was obtained by ultra filtration. So this is just to like uh, get uh, the particular hydrosylate that was in our uh, protein uh, um, digest, and then we we check out for the anti cancer ca capacity, and then from the result, we found that. Uh, the lower molecular protein, the minus, I mean, less than one kilo Dalton, had the highest uh, inhibitory effect on the cellular, uh, on the uh, cell uh, um, viability. And so that, you know, showed us that that was the, I mean, the short uh, molecular amino acid uh, had the highest anti cancer property. So we didn't need to like do the three to five and one to three. So we just characterized the uh, less than one kilo Dalton protein, and then we sequence the amino acid, and that was where we got the KKK um, LN. That was the six bioactive peptide, which is the one that has the anti-cancer property. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Delaco. Um, so, as many of us that 
this, answer this, ask these questions for more clarity also. You could also yeah. um, meet him, get the slides and go through them. Thank you very much. It was really yeah. insightful. Thank so you. moving on to um, our discussion for today, it will be very important after we have heard some of the topics that have gone on today, it's very important for us to discuss. Now, um, the topic says pursuing bioscience research careers in Africa, the challenges and the prospects. Pursuing bioscience research careers in Africa, the challenges and the prospects. And generally, we know that the theme for our anniversary is bioscience, the present and the future. So it is beautiful before we begin to talk about challenges and prospects. It's beautiful to know how far the few the areas of bioscience has come, and then we can know where it's going to. Um, in the past, we before now, and in olden times, just as was mentioned in the discussion in the symposium today, bioscience has has very little relevance, or the relevance of bioscience is not well known in Africa. And for the purpose of our communication, would direct our communication to Nigeria. And in the past. The interest in science has always been either to, in, in the life sciences or that has always been to study either engine, um, um, medicine or pharmacy or dentistry. And then maybe if you want to go still just do something related, you can also not choose to go for nursing. So this has all this had always been how it was until later we got to start finding out of the other bioscience courses like biochemistry, anatomy, and physiology. But then despite People still, since they don't, people didn't know about it, or since people don't know about it, they still chose um, virus, the medicines. But then um, eventually, most of the people began to settle for biochemistry when they realized they couldn't go for chemistry or they couldn't go for um, medicine or they couldn't go for the others, maybe because their score wasn't so high, or they just knew they didn't like these areas and um, there's, not, there's no other alternative. And you just go for the next available one, microbiology, biochemistry, and, and the rest like that. That was the issue. So moving forward, the education system now has bred, has presented it is a structure that, ha, that has made even the student, incoming students just believe that after this, there's no opportunity outside. Most of the time, while we were in school, in my undergrad level days, I studied medical biochemistry. In my undergrad level days, when we were discussing the fields of the opportunities available for medical biochemistry, the lecturers, the lecturer handling that in those areas were quite vague in explaining to us what opportunities lie ahead of this course. And then the best they could also offer is lecturing. And while we were also in undead level, speaking with the senior colleagues that had passed out or senior colleagues that were already in the professional world, we need to ask them how have they been handling um, biosciences? Most of them, the best they could tell you is study masters or go abroad to study or others just you just need to find out that others have gone into other areas some are now working in banks and everything like that that is looking at the past so before we move to ahead i would like to put the question across to everyone now how do you think what do you think is the is the um exposure of bioscience in nigeria presently what how well do you think the nigerian community or the nigerian or nigeria as is ex how exposed you think Nigeria is to bioscience and bioscience research? This is a question I'm opening to the house now, and please, I would like every of our contributions to, towards, towards this topic. Good evening, everybody. Hello, good evening. Good evening, this. Okay. Uh, I don't think bioscience is really open. It's very in Nigeria as a as a case study. The issue we are lacking is most of us go to school, finish up, and we lack places or facilities where we can effectively apply some of the things we have learned. In general, an average graduate from the field of biochemistry, microbiology, uh, chemistry, and some others tend not to work with their degree, even when you have passion for it. One thing we must understand is that even after going to school, one endeavor everybody wants to do is they have least a way to fend for themselves. And in Africa, we'll have sufficient research institutes or facilities that will enable one to explore some of these things. 
I remember particularly I'm a fanatic of biochemistry. I'm in love with biochemistry. I fell in love with biochemistry. Although funnily, it was true through some movies. I don't know if some of us are familiar with Kyle XY and uh, the Beauty and the Beast. Watching that seasonal movie got an aspect of me that made me fall in love with biochemistry, knowing that I could do a lot of things when it comes to plants, animal research, and likewise. So in Africa and Nigeria as a case study, bioscience has a low standing for two reasons. One, lack of appropriate research centers or centers or jobs or areas where we can effectively apply the knowledge that we have gained. That's one. Two, even when you have the passion for this thing, the general consensus in discouraging most persons is the fact that there's no job after graduating. Three, there are no facilities. Take for example, during the just concluded COVID issues that we're facing across the world. I was paying during that time when we were in lockdown, and most of us even have the base of our chemistry, do not even have an outer of a facility where we could even play a role in providing possible remedy to the COVID that was rampaging the world at that point in time. I even had professors in my department who I was so angry with them, like I was expecting, you expect them to be doing something as Africans, as scientists who have studied over the years. So it boils down to the entire system as a whole. So I believe there's a low tolerance in terms of bioscience. And it will continue like this unless the structural structures are put in place. I'll conclude with this. A few years, when I started my master's program, I met some group of biochemists who opened a research lab. I was very happy initially. But when I got there, I wanted to learn from them so that to broaden my practical aspect. I begged them that let's put this thing effectively in good use. Because in places like university, we lack adequate research facilities or labs where even PhD students and master's students can come and do some of their lab work. If it's fish drying we're focusing on, if it's a particular molecular technique we want to focus on, let us be known that this is what we do. But funny enough, what did they do? A few years later, out of greed, out of the fact that they lost the zeal for it, they let it life follow. That's not that lost about chemists because that could have led to something else beyond, beyond the small way they were looking at it. So that's my humble submission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Idris. Thank you very much. Um, are there any more contributions towards that? What do you think is the... Okay, a light on. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Yeah, um, well, for me, I personally do think now that um, we are in a better place compared to um, times there before, before. Because um, I think um, COVID, so fine, it was a, we understand that it's a pandemic, but you know, it kind of like um, helped um, bioscience research and all. Because um, why, why do I say this? Because, you know, though somehow, some way, the whole attention was it ended up um, going to the um, frontline workers, that is the doctors, the nurses, because, you know, those were the, those are the people um, having to treat um, people that, um, um, got COVID, you know, so the whole attention was um, going to the frontline workers because they were the one working at them, um, you know, when the whole world was in pandemic. But, you know, with the, um, with the um, research technologies that were used to develop the vaccine, the mRNA technology that was used, I know, I think, I think it put um, scientists on the, on the world map, sort of, it put us on the world map to know that, you know, so the whole world is dependent on you know certain scientists to do um, this to that would have to you know come up with a vaccine you know that eventually the whole world will have to be dependent on you know and which is what um, is um, being distributed now we have Pfizer, Moderna, and the rest that you know is being distributed all over the world now and these were all. Um, um, jobs of um, and works of some scientists somewhere, you know, that came up with this vaccine. So I think yes, fine. The um, attention went to um, 
the, the frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses and all, but I think it still puts us, um, biosense research and scientists in general on the world map sort of. So I think we're in a better place compared to um, um, before. And I think it's, it can only get better. We can, we can only get better. So that's my, that's my own take for now. Okay, thank you very much, Elijah. Okay, so now moving ahead, moving on with what on the discussion. Okay, so why are you preparing for this topic? Why are you preparing for this topic? I it got to me. I was I the a question popped in my head. Yes, there's a problem. Bioscience, the acceptance of bioscience in Nigeria is very low, both for um jobs and then both in schools too. But then the next question now comes in. Who is at fault? What is the cause of this problem? Now, is it the lecturers that are handling this course? Is it the students that are going into the course that are not passionate about it? Is it the researchers graduating from these courses and are not implementing what they have studied? Who exactly is at fault? Because while I was, I was thinking about it, I said, um, if you're going, going to the institutions presently, the persons in charge of our education now are actually um, individual uh, lecturers now, uh, lecturers now were the first people to be exposed to the field of bioscience. So that means they are practicing it, right? So who is at fault? What is the cause of the problem? Okay, well, if you have your hand raised, are you, attend are you attending this um, question or the previous one? Please go ahead. Okay, this question. Um, I think the fault was partly mentioned when the, um, when Olaito and them, um, the other, um, I think Mr. Idris spoke. Um, I think the lack of structure, whether um, structure in the way bioscience courses are taught, as well as structure in the in sense of infrastructures for graduates or students, bioscience students to kind of have hands on experience with what they are learning in the classroom. So I think that's like a major problem, the lack of structure. That's my contribution. Okay. Lack of structure. Hello, Chinaza. You have your hands raised. Please go on. Hi, Manuel. Um, so I believe we are at fault, right? Everybody in general is at fault. And I'll say this because, and I'm going to like touch on something most people haven't touched on, and that's the fact that we are not reliable people. Just like um, Dr. Iswami, um, I hope I'm pronouncing his name well, mentioned. You can you imagine someone that did a project, he has public, um, publications, papers, and then you ask him to defend his project and he cannot even tell you what he did. That shows you that there's something wrong somewhere. Probably he didn't do it, probably he plagiarized, probably he stole someone's data. And that's the fact. And I say fact, that's the problem the bioscience world in Nigeria is facing. There are a lot of job opportunities for Africans. Like there are a lot of opportunities for bioscientists, like for the Western world to, in, to invest in us. Let me just say that. But they can hardly do that because we're not we're not credible. You have um, researchers do work and they fabricate data. So how do you expect these other companies to trust you when you, you know, you, you've showed them that, okay, you're not a trustworthy person. They give you work to do, they give you um, research to do. They're probably going to fabricate the, the results. So I feel this is the problem because if we, if we prove ourselves to be reliable, we will get the opportunity. When we get the opportunity, we'll have the opportunity to structure ourselves. But we cannot structure ourselves when we don't even have the opportunity. Nobody's giving us anything because we're not trustworthy people. So I believe that's like, that's what I'm saying. I'm coming from somewhere that we've not touched before. I believe that's, this is the first thing we have to set. We have to prove to the Western world that, see, we are a different brand of researchers. Going forward, you can trust us to give you a life better. And I believe when we do that, sorry for the background noise, and I believe when we do that, we will get more opportunities. For more opportunities, we get the ability to structure ourselves better. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, please, are there more additions? Are there more contributions yes, yes, towards please. this? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Please go on. Uh, once again, good evening, everybody. Um, just to what she said just now, 
uh, it's not about, there's one issue, it also boils down to structure. I remember doing one of my classes then, a professor told us that during their master's program in Nigeria, they had all the reagents or the chemicals that are required for them to carry out their laboratory work. Now the issue is this, you have spent over a million naira on your research work, of which if you understand most researches in Nigeria are conducted by private funds. That's the first thing we need to know. Now, this is not me in any way supporting fabrication. It is totally and appropriately wrong. Secondly, thirdly, you have spent over a million naira on your bench work, on research work. Let's say your master's degree research, your master's research in Nigeria. And your results are extremely negative. In a standard word, you are expected to report the routinely following all necessary precautions. But in Nigeria, if you were to show some of those your work to your supervisor, the first comment that will be made was that you can't be getting these results. Now, having spent a million naira on research, because I have several colleagues here on this, and you're still spending more. Believe me, you, it will give grounds for such as against a scenarios where appropriate uh, infrastructures, appropriate uh, materials that are required for the research are provided. Self funding, self funding of research is also another thing that is killing bioscience in Africa. Most of those top research you see that they do abroad are not self funded. They are funded either by the companies or by institutes or by governments. Even basic undergraduate work, how are they funded? They are funded by personal money, which are not supposed to be so. So it boils down to one, the system, as the first thing I must say. Secondly, is that as lecturers, which I believe some of us will become soon, we must be able to understand what is called translational research. There are moments where the result is like that. You don't have to, inter you don't have to temper it. You don't have to mix, construe it to suit a particular way. That's, that's wrong. That would be terribly wrong. If whatever you are getting indicate that it's black, let it be written that for my research in my lab, it could be shown that the reaction was black. But most times, certain researchers already have a pre-planned result in their head that they are expecting. So if it doesn't go that way, whatever you do, even when you do it the right way. And you can't argue with some of these persons because they are senior professors and doctors. So in that case, what would you do? So the fabrication alone doesn't just boil down to us. If it does, most Nigerians who go abroad not have excelled so excellently well. Because they had a platform. All I have to do is go to the lab, take the chemicals, and I work. And when my result is not going well, I repeat it. When the case where you have used a millionaire and you want to go again, you have to use another millionaire, you agree with me that it will take a lot, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nasiruddin said something. He said, lack of leaders to climb on. Those that have succeeded in leading, in reaching the apex, do not care about others. The system is also highly politicized. Those hard not to crack subjects like biochemistry is not regarded as professional. But the sister trained disciplines like med medical lab and science lab are tagged professional with prefix SLT and MLS. I was going to ask, I was going to talk about that now in my in I am still talking about the cost of the problem. I was going to mention this. I was going to say is it the lack of scientific communication from these courses like the bio, biochemistry, the um theology and co. Is it the lack of communication that are, that has that has left them in the dark for so long? Because now courses like um I, I'm from the department of I'm from the faculty of basic medical science. And before leaving my faculty, um, the highest after medicine, the next highest was um, nursing. And at a point in time, I began hearing that 
um, medical laboratory science would start giving, offering doctorate degrees. So you just, you could study medical laboratory science for six years and be given a doctorate degree. So you'd be called a doc, not doctorate degree, sorry, you'd be called a doctor of medical laboratory science. And then I began wondering, what is the issue? Okay, and then while discussing those days in school, you hear they have a body, they have a stronger body and everything like that. So what is the issue? What is making some areas seem to go higher? Because this now, in a way, it has changed the focus of bioscience. We know these this areas of these areas of study, like um, like we mentioned, like I just mentioned, medical laboratory science, nothing. Those are bio, biosciences, but they don't handle research. You understand? And then, um, if the focus is towards the practical side of bioscience and not the research side, there is a tilt. So it's almost like um, we are trying to use, but we're not producing. You understand? And then there's an issue. So my question I was like, isn't the problem in our scientific communication? I know this has been mentioned over time and over, and we've discussed about this before now, but is it not the fact that these people that have gone far didn't properly communicate their, their researches, didn't properly communicate their studies um, to, the, to the policymakers? Hello, Festus, you have a question, you have a contribution. Yes, um, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, um, thank you so much for everything you've talked about. Um, so I'll be taking the questions from three different um, angles. Now, the first thing is culture. Someone talked about the fact that we are not trusted. The thing is, even ourselves, we don't trust ourselves. That's the first thing. But it's not a matter of trusting ourselves or not. There's no perfect system. Um, system. That's, what, um, that's the first thing I want us to understand. For the mere fact that there's no perfect system, it boils down to culture. What's the collective culture of a nation? Do you understand? It's not only in bioscience, it's in every aspect of our lives and every aspect of our culture. So in that cultural sense, there's this, um, it's not really dishonesty, it's just the fact that people tend to manipulate things because of the fact that we need to actually, like Professor, I'm sorry, like Dr. Esaomi said, we need to be promoted, do you understand? So there's this collective culture that has spread like a canker worm and nobody is willing to actually do anything noble again because at the end of the day, how do you measure success in places like Africa, in places like Nigeria? Tell me, how do you measure success? Mostly success is measured by money and maybe traditional titles, but majorly it's money. That's, that's how success is measured in um, Africa and Nigeria. So these are one of the things that have driven younger people. When you see you are not even accepted for, for the ideas you bring or for the mere fact that you are an intellectual and you have no results to show for it. I saw something that challenged me a few days ago. It said, sometimes it is not the result, it is the effort. Because sometimes results don't show. But when efforts continue, Someday, somehow, the results will, will, will show. All these countries we keep mentioning, they have been doing these things for a long time. And maybe tomorrow, when we start to discuss, I will open some of these things in, in, in my discussion. Now, the, the thing is, after our collective culture, there's poverty. Do you understand? And poverty is not money alone. Poverty can be of the pocket, can be of the brain, can be of the mind, and can be of ideas. Poverty comes in many forms. As long as there's poverty, there won't be any meaningful development. You understand? So, and like doctor, is, I'll keep making reference to it. You see, um, science is treated as, um, how do I put it? It's, it's treated like an holy grail that some specialized people should go into. And that's why I will come into the fact that someone, okay, I think it was you that mentioned the fact that people are creating professional bodies. All of these things are born out of pride and the need to be recognized. Science is collective, it is not individual. So the mere fact that they are saying they want to create a body that is stronger than a body, uh, a biochemist cannot work in a biochem uh, bio blah, 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 lab. It's, it's just out of pride and they need to be recognized that they are doing something, which is not the case. Science does not care whether you are a mathematician or you are a biochemist, as long as you can do the required things. You are welcome. And today I was having discussion. No, not today. I was talking to someone. I said, 
if you if i would advise you to study anything i would just say to study computer science why it seems to be the most the areas that people did not tap into before just because of the fact that they thought you could only deal with computers now it is applicable everywhere just because of data and that is what happens when you open your mind if you look at most universities abroad especially in the uk they are so specialized and that is one of the things that the uk is known for you could see a department that they are studying proteins like Samuel said and like Samuel was talking to us about they could be studying only proteins I once saw a department that I was really interested in I was just like so you people study only these things damn that's really good so the thing is in science everybody is welcome so but because of the need to actually and be recognized these people or this set of people that you mentioned they have actually broken the body of science just for recognition I'm a medical laboratory scientist. It doesn't make any sense. Where I um, do my school today, I think I'm the only person studying biochemistry. And funny thing is that if they ask, if I ask them something about maybe what we are doing, and they don't know, they just tell me they don't know. You are studying biochemistry, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not my like. It's just not because they don't know, but it's just because. There's this intercollective um, interconnectivity between all of these sciences. Everybody brings in the idea. It will not surprise the first time I knew that the head of our lab was a physicist. It was really funny. She was a physicist. She didn't even study any. She didn't study anything close to biochemistry, pharmacy, or anything that you think we might be doing. So that's where the confusion comes. You now be like, how did this person get into this place? Like. You are a professor of, she's a professor of physics, she's a professor of calculus, and she's a professor of biophysics. So she has three professorships. Now, and everything was not gotten differently. It was gotten just because that's what she, there's this interconnectivity in application. So when you look at all of these things, there's no pride in science. You bring what you know, I bring what I know, we do things together. And that's why when you say, they can um, when they talk about collaborating with Africans, it's not that they don't trust us. They don't trust the system itself. They don't trust the system itself. So because the system is wired, I can't say the system is wired to fail. But when you study systems and you study the systems of Africa, you will know that sometimes it's like our systems are wired to fail. And I might want to talk about a bit of colonial undertones and colonialism. And this is what has led to most of this is maybe tomorrow I'll really expand it. But when you look at a country like the United Kingdom, United Kingdom is so small in the scheme of things, but they are doing big things. So the strength yeah. is not numbers. Like um, the, the, the great man said, he said, our strength is not in numbers. Discipline is the soul of an army. It makes a small number formidable and gives power to the weak. And procures esteem to everybody. So it is not about the people, uh, we are a group of uh, medical laboratory scientists, we are a group of nursing, uh, this is this, this is that. No, there was a point in time while I was in school, I and my dad were having a discussion. He was saying, should we are studying biological chemistry? They just packaged this into biochemistry. And I said, well, you might be right. And I don't have anything to prove to you because you would not even understand what I'm doing. So it got to a time when, all of these relational things started to come in place. Like the person who talked about translational sciences. Now, to interest you to know, there's a particular university, I don't know, I think it's Leeds in the UK, they study translation, there's something known as translational research, it's a department. So all of these attempts by this Western world is just to understand how interconnectivity can play, but not in Africa and not in Nigeria. So there's a problem of collective culture. All of us think we are honest until we have the <laughs> we are faced with the option of having to, to do something dishonest. So you think you are honest until you are faced with the decision. So until then, please don't criticize gently. I think that would be my, my parting words. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Um so far we've mentioned the lack of structure as a reason for the problem in Nigeria. We've mentioned the unreliability of us as individuals ranging from our top researchers down to the students going into the areas of bioscience. And um, I'm, I'm sure I, and I'm, and I'm certain that the, platform, the platforms like this bring information like this to our knowledge. Platforms like this bring information like this to our, our awareness. But sometimes we passively walk through it 
the society and ignore these things. So I'm, I'm sure at the end of these events, begin to look out for these things that we to correct them in our individual environment. So just like Professor said, criticize gently because you don't know when you get exposed to this environment or to this situation or to these circumstances. And then you might act the same way these people you have criticized so far as acted. Okay, so moving on into our discussion, we can move on into our discussion. Um, then I was going to, I, 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 thinking about all these things, Olaiton said something. Uh, Olaiton mentioned the fact that there is hope. There is, things are not as bad as um, we would say it is, or things are, things are not looking as bad as it was. And yes, it's the truth. Yes, it's the truth. The, 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 the field of bioscience has come so far in Nigeria that there's actually an awareness of it present. Because um, as much as we know or as much as we don't know, there are actually private institutions, or private um, establishments that are actually practicalizing um, bioscience researches, just that we don't know about them. We, going into different institutions, we get to uh, get exposed to them. And just like he said also, this COVID-19 and the pandemic presently brought about the awareness of the importance of research and the awareness of the importance of researchers. Well, we all know um, the present um, 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 industry that has been scaling so far in Nigeria that has actually brought a good amount of awareness to the bioscience in Nigeria, or in, yes, in Nigeria locally. And that is, and one of them is 54 Gene. We know how the vision of the company is to um, create a biobank for Africa where there will be data available for African research because before now, drug design, drug research, pharmaceutical researches have always been done using the information that was, that was generated from the uh, um, genetic informations of foreigners. And it's, we all know basically that um, African um, uh, genetics have wider information. But moving out of that, there's now, there's an establishment like that. And funny thing is, there are more smaller in the small, smaller, smaller establishments like that that we don't know about. What, what made me go to know that I, 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 I'm presently in Ibadan and until late or not, and I got to find out a company here in Ibadan carry out a polymerase chain reaction. And it's a, it's a private institution though, they carry out genetic researches. So they carry out um, DNA paternity tests and they do private um, COVID-19 testing. And I'm sure also that in other areas, these are areas that are also being, these are, these are fields that are also being brought about. And then it dawned on me that biosense are started, are started evolving. It is, and just like Dr. Isawomi said, um, it, is not, it is no longer the biosense we know of a white of a man with beards in a lab mixing things together. It is evolving and it is very important we all also become aware of the evolution of science and engage in it. So the prospect of, of bioscience now, um, I, I, I believe after now, even before now, I've been a bioscience, this, I, at one time, I, after my IT in school, I kind of got bored of, of working in the lab because to me, I felt it was too routine. The same set of research we do today, the same, the same set of tests we do today, the same set of tests we do tomorrow and the next tomorrow and over and over again. The only thing you just do is maybe just get to see different results. And I got bored of it. And, Ever since then, I've been thinking, what, how can I practicalize my study of bioscience? How can I practicalize this thing? Well, I've gotten a path for myself. And I, I, my, I would implore everyone of us also to begin to find out, find out our various niches and begin to work in it. it is, we've grown past the pointing hands, pointing fingers at the problems or pointing fingers at the cause of these problems. Why am I saying this? Now we have gone into the digital era the world has gone so digital that every information, everything that you're going to present now is must be backed by data. And just with little data, the importance or the impact of a research goes a very, very long way. And so presently I've come to see that, um, I've, I've met a data analyst. She studied a bioscience related course and she's not working in the lab, but she's a data analyst. And with the data she gets from various research she carries out. Now they can, they are better um, uh, approach towards that area she's solving. And that is a prospect in the bioscience, in the field of bioscience. The field of bioscience has grown wider than it is, than we all know. 
Um, and um, um, very recently on LinkedIn, we saw of a medical a medical uh, student or a medical yeah a medical student. He made a drawing, he made a diagram of a fetus, but a black fetus this time around. After realizing that we've only and always seen white babies, images of white babies, that is a solution. That is an area he discovered for himself. And normally, we have not, we might have not been giving thought to that. We might have not been giving thoughts to that. But I've never been thinking of all those areas. We have always probably been focusing on how I'm going to get to the lab, how I'm going to do this research, how I'm going to do this research. But then, just like Dr. Isawumi mentioned, and just as I have actually thought before now too, science or research doesn't start in the lab. Before you go into the lab to get carried out research, there has to have been a problem you identified to solve before the thought of going to the lab to research comes in. So first thing first is identifying our areas or identifying problems around us and solutions that we can offer to these areas solutions we can offer to these areas. Um, presently, yeah, there's a wide trend of te technological advancement. We, have know of, we know of the artificial intelligence robots that can carry out, um, robots actually that can carry out surgical processes. We all know of, um, um, we know of the development of um, applications. These are areas that could be ventured into by bioscientists. Because we can't wait for just like um, I think it was it first as I said he advised us to go into study studying computer science. We can't all wait for an engineer to come design an app. Meanwhile, a bioscientist knows every function of that app better than he than the engineer would. I'm not trying to compartmentalize it. Just like we all know that now that science is not a, it's not a matter of this I am this or I am that is doing this and providing solutions to it. But at the end of the day, we shouldn't now claim people are taking our roles if we're not making ourselves available to fill these roles. So let us not just stop in the area that I know this science. Let us going to find out areas that we can apply or areas that we can solve problems to. I could go on and on. I could begin to mention different career paths and I could begin to mention different areas. And I'm sure we personally have different areas of interest. And um, I, I got to find out over time that we, we have a good number of writers in our midst. We have a good number of content creators in our midst. We have a good number of graphic designers in our midst. We have a good number of, of, of um, programmers in our midst presently. And some of us might feel these areas are irrelevant to the science, to our bioscience knowledge, or it might be might need too much of a deviation. But the truth is, it isn't, because we are the best persons to write our science articles. We can't keep giving out our, our roles to uh, ask students to write for us, or we can't keep giving out our rules to people because they can write. We are the best person to write our articles. We are the best person to come up with our designs because we understand these things better. So we are the best person to design our applications. We are the best person to design our softwares. We are the best person to, to present this thing properly. If we, if we can get first, get efficient and effective scientific communication or science communication, we have to tell our story. Don't keep waiting for people to tell it all for us. So now the, what it all drives towards is develop the skill that it requires also. Identify a problem, think of the solution and develop the skill. Don't wait for someone to come and do it for you. I would, I would end with this story. While I was in my, doing, based on this, what we've pointed out, while I was in school, um, I carried out a research on the effects of um, psychotropic substances, that is cannabis, uh, on, on the fertility profile of of individuals. And the research was so interesting, though it was very, very costly. Sure. And uh, over time, I have done everything, but the problem is I didn't know how to analyze my data. I really didn't know how to analyze it. I did not convert it into graph and present it. So what I did was I gave my I gave the data to someone. And when the person analyzed the data and I got the result, the result was actually making a lot of sense. I was like, wow, this is nice. I took the results to my lecturer, that is my project supervisor, and we went through it, we were discussing about it. So when I got back home, I was not studying this thing deeply, I was not looking at it because I was preparing to defend my project. And then I noticed an error. What was the error? Because I, I, I compared my results between the people that take substances and people that don't take substances. So that was like a switch. So instead of into, while he was preparing the data, he made a switch instead of, placing the people that take substances on the people that don't, now place the people that don't on the people that do. 
Well, it was a very slight error that nobody would notice. He didn't notice it, but I did notice it. And that slight error affected the whole data. So me, I know where the error came from, but I couldn't go back to point out this error to the man. Then I could I go to tell my, my progress of so that, sir, see, there was a mistake here. And then what did I do? I corrected it by myself. I just made a slight, I just adjusted my, uh, adjusted my, um, my write up in my article, that's my, uh, my what called it, my project's work, just to adjust, adjust it to their result that was available now. And then made it, I presented it. So me personally, I was very scared. I was now scared that my project supervisor doesn't publish this work because it, was, it actually was a very interesting topic. So this actually is a problem to bioscience. I know we've mentioned the area of reliability, reliability and everything. And now one thing I have to also mention Dina, is being honest enough to identify your mistake, owning up to it too. Because this is a mistake on a level that does not even from my side, does not from anybody's side. It was not like I intentionally forged the result. The result was there. But now there was a slight error that affected the outcome of the research. I know our time is fast spent. I know we still want to contribute towards this topic. So please, um, I would implore us all to stay in touch, stay in, uh, stay. Um, in touch with this, uh, our every of the processes, that will be, every of the discussion, every of the um, teachings that will be going on throughout this, the course of this anniversary. Thank you very much for being a part of today's session. It was very great. So um, we would be expecting us all to be part of our session tomorrow. I'm sure we've all learned a lot from today's session. I'm sure it was very impactful. Every part of it, today's session was wonderful. And tomorrow's session also promises to be far better than today. So um, let's begin to anticipate tomorrow as we would be rounding off for today. As many of us as have contribution towards this discussion, because I know I didn't give a lot of us chance to communicate properly. As many of us as have um, contributions towards this, you can go ahead to the WhatsApp chat but, um, and express ourselves properly. But from this um, end and for the uh, for our schedule for today, uh, we'll call it a day. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for the session. Thank you very much for being part of today's session. We'll be looking forward to see you guys tomorrow. Thank you very much.